My name is John Simmerall. I'm an electrical engineer and a neuroscientist at Brown University and uh, a number of other affiliations that I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and it's, it's a little interesting, actually, to talk about technology, advanced technology, in this forum. Um, so I'm just going to kind of talk about the things that I know and what we're doing and um, see what your, your reaction is to that. So I'm going to talk about our Brain Gate project at, at the VA and at Brown um, in affiliation with lots of other entities that are funding agencies, everyone from uh, NIH, uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs is a, is a wonderful sponsor, um, as well as some private foundations who give us uh, money to do things that are not within the realm of what the other agencies are funding. So with, uh, with that funding in mind, uh, we have a wonderful team of people. Uh, I'm sort of the, uh, the poor representative here of a lot of other people's wonderful work. So I uh, certainly credit that team of people dispersed, uh, not only here on the East Coast, but also colleagues at Stanford University, Case Western, uh, as well as some colleagues uh, in Germany, at the uh, German Space Agency, and uh, as well as uh, some folks at Dean Kamen, uh, the inventor of the Segway, has done some work with us in the Rewise that I'll talk about. Uh, one thing I need to say at the beginning is that I'll be talking about technology, which is in a um, IDE state's clinical trial uh, investigation only. So, only. so only participants in our trial can, can uh, uh, actually have any sort of experience with this at the moment. So given the scenarios that we're talking about with uh, severe uh, motor disability, uh, cases where some sort of injury to the brain or the spinal cord uh, causes a situation where somebody with uh, what might otherwise be a, a, an intact brain, a fully functioning cognitive brain, is unable to communicate, is unable to move, um, and there's a number of situations where this arises. Spinal cord injury, I've shown Christopher Reeve here. It's a relatively uh, obvious case where uh, breaking the spinal cord is going to prevent signals getting down to your muscles. Uh, but there's many others. We've heard about stroke. Um, unfortunately, there are some uh, weak points in the vasculature of the brainstem that make strokes of uh, uh, these types, um, unfortunately, too common. Uh, and there's many other levels of motor disability, which maybe one day the technology we're talking about uh, could participate in advancing solutions or uh, at least providing some assistance to. And then LIMWOX, the VA, uh, is very interested in providing um, sophisticated motor control to advanced prosthetic arms for the vets that are coming back with limbs. So just a quick introduction to uh, some brain anatomy. Uh, the, the scan on the left is uh, a side scan. The eyes are in that little crevice uh, uh, pointing out to the left and the tongue below that. And you can see the brain stem, the spinal cord is the long thin gray area coming up into the, uh, the wavy areas of the brain. That big round blob uh, is in the middle of the picture is uh, the major part of the brain stem. That part of the brainstem is phylogenetically older. That means it evolved uh, early and carries a lot of really important functions. The cranial nerves uh, almost universally go through the brainstem. So uh, sensation um, relays into the cere uh, cerebellum control, motor movement, um, um, hearing nuclei, all sorts of functions. Uh, because they evolved early, that whole part are there and subject to compromise in, in the case of brainstem stroke. Um, in the lower right, you can see a blue line that comes down from a gray area, which is the cortical uh, matter that's the, the wavy part of the brain that you usually think of when you think of the brain, at least from the outside. All the inner structures have been stripped away, and the blue represents a single fiber that comes from an area that controls motor uh, movement. It comes down through the white matter, all those fibers are, are the white matter that carries signals from the brain down into the spinal cord. Um, by way of that bulbous area that I described where the arrow, the top black arrow is. So the fibers to control movement um, are originating up in the cortex where you decide you want to make a movement of what that movement looks like. And that signal trans, uh, traverses down through the brainstem to the spinal cord. Um, 
So how do I know where that signal comes from for motor control? I'm going to be talking a lot about room control. That's our, what we specialize in. But it's a long history of uh, research in animals and um, now with us in humans as well that shows uh, the segregation of functions in different parts of the brain. So the yellow uh, markations are a common place where in anyone's brain, anybody in this room, I can go to a, a particular region identified by the special curvature that we all share in the gyri of the brain and know within a millimeter or two where to go to point to the area that controls arm and and I know that those fires will be descend just as I've shown here. Now that's not the only area that controls movement. There's lots of planning, there's lots of alternative movements that you might make, there's other types of control. And these are spread out in the other colored areas. Um, and uh, they all contribute. So as complex as the brain is, it's also very redundant. So it's possible to damage certain areas and still have function in others that you might be able to tap into. So for the scenarios that we're talking about here, we're looking for some means to provide communication to somebody whose uh, standard means are not functioning. There's lots of technologies out there. You've heard about some of them this morning. Um, a finger switch, a head tracker, eye gaze tracker, lots of technologies which try to uh, capture any residual motor control that the individual might have. And I think uh, I would can accurately say that the large majority of these types of technologies get tried um, and for the most part discarded, uh, particularly as that residual function becomes less reliable. So I'm going to talk about some advanced technologies to provide communication, but I have to say that we have a wonderful person in our laboratory, Dan Basher, whose uh, objective is to make these sorts of easy technologies really work well. And what I've shown on the bottom left is a uh, hand tracker where he's, he's applied a, a marker to the finger. And unlike the other technologies, he's taken advantage of all the computational knowledge we have in our team to make this robust. The same thing with uh, the picture in the middle there, you can see a bright light on the eyebrow. Sometimes the eyebrow function is one of the last remaining functions. Um, and what Dan has been able to do using our, our statistical techniques is make this immune to the types of problems we heard about earlier. If the head moves around, the angle changes, somebody slouches in the chair, this system is able to automatically recalibrate find that signal and allow the person to still make yes and no sorts of responses by an algorithm if they have that control, or to move their finger. Um, what we normally have with the other technologies is as soon as somebody slumps, family member has to come in, recalibrate that system, and after a few days or a few weeks of that, the system is pretty much so although I'm going to talk about some advanced technologies, we also have a great effort uh, underway to take simple and expensive things to make them better and more reliable uh, for individuals that have some sort of residual control. But that's not always the case. So in this case, if the signal from the spinal cord is broken by a spinal cord injury, by uh, ALS, for example, where the signal simply can't propagate down those axons anymore, um, the solution that we've taken is to go in and find the signal at the source in the intact brain, the piece of what we think is still functioning, bring that signal out, make sense of it, and use technology to drive something that allow the individual to communicate. So we need a sensor in the brain. We need to uh, have some sort of algorithm that makes sense of all that information that we record. And then some effector, either a computer cursor to drive. Um, we actually are working with people at Cleveland to drive muscles to actually stimulate the individual's own muscles. Um, but for today, we're really interested about communication. You heard about uh, the, the New York lab, and, and the most obvious thing might be, well, just put a cap on. Uh, you're all familiar with uh, the ability to sort of monitor seizures and epilepsy using an external cap, and it's, it's done in regular hospitals all over the country. And uh, there's some ability, uh, potentially, you can control yes no sorts of answers uh, using this recording. The problem is that really what you're getting in the scalp is more state-based. It's uh, uh, are you drowsy, are you alert, are you having a seizure? It's possible to start to control those types of states to make those more answers. Um, but what we'd really like to do is tap into the part of the motor system that drives the wonderfully complex and rich motor commands to something like the arm so that we can have much more robust communication in this. 
So here's how we do that. We have a sensor, this one's flipped upside down, but it's an array of electrodes that can record from the electrical activity in the brain. Uh, there's a gold bundle that carries all those signals up to a connector on the uh, pedestal, and that connector uh, gets screwed to the scalp. And that gets implanted, this array gets implanted into the brain. Um, and with that in place, we attach a connector to the pedestal and actually record the brain signals. And if we take that off to a card of uh, algorithm computers, we can maybe make sense of it. So let me give you a sense of what goes on in the brain. We uh, talked a little bit about uh, imagining certain things uh, to get that EEG cap to recognize external responses. If we're down in the part of the brain that controls the arm, we can ask an individual uh, to imagine squeezing their hand, for example, and recording from the right neurons, uh, we'll record that signal. So let me show you what that looks like. Right here is uh, not an EEG, but that's the uh, electrical signature of a cell communicating to its downstream part. I'm going to come out of PowerPoint today to show you this. Training. He didn't have to learn how to do this. 
You raise in, do what you do, imagine moving your hand, and it works. Um, that's the, uh, this gentleman is uh, locked in and has been, at this point, uh, for, for many years at the time of this year. So now the idea of eye gaze being a problem, uh, you'd like to have a task where you can present sort of the, the thing that you want to communicate in the middle of the screen in sort of a big space. I'll talk about sort of finer grain resolution things later, but in this case, we've uh, trained our algorithm to recognize when the individual wants to imagine squeezing their hand. Uh, the letters are going to appear in blocks, and when it gets to the group of letters that contains the letter this individual wants to spell out, um, they'll, they'll imagine the squeeze, and then it'll walk through each of the four letters um, in the block in order to uh, get to the point uh, of what he wants to say. So, I'm going to skip forward here. He's already typed out using this message. Uh, think of you often, and I'll just I'll show you how this gets finished up and maybe you can get around some of this. Here, but what we've done here 
Um, now with, with uh, Kathy and with our participant T2, as you have identified, uh, is trained as to go to recognize three degrees of movement and ask them to control the hand, move the hand to the sphere as it comes up. When they get the hand around it, go ahead and squeeze on it to let us know that it's where they want it to be. So it's pretty rough, um, but it's a starting point that gives us proof of concept that we can begin to pull out the information for this type of thing, hopefully giving us the tools and the algorithms and the statistical capabilities we need to be better, not only at this, but at the simple 2D cursor control, at the 1D click control, um, to provide some really useful types of functions. So given that, what's, what does this really look like? Um, what's going to happen with this? Is this something that's real or not? Well, I have to say that, uh, obviously, <laughs> you know, you're not probably going to be happy about having a pedestal uh, out of your skull. We're not happy about that. And at the moment, that pedestal is connected to a cable that carries all those little signals down to the amplifier which sits on the back of the chair or on the floor. Um, we're actually well on our way to making that all go away. Uh, I can't show you the picture I asked Arthur and Enrico if I could show you the picture, but I can tell you that the scientists at the conference I was just at saw the system that takes all that away. The pedestal's still there. We screw on a wireless connector and it screens out 100 channels of neural signals at a very high bandwidth wirelessly to a listening decoder in your body. Um, so that's the transmitter, and it's uh, in, you know, it's, it's a road through FDA approval, of course, but the technology is, is in place. The other thing you want to get rid of is this big part of computers that I haven't shown you that there's all the big Christian and all that stuff. Um, I'm happy to say that the VA is very interested in making that go away as well. And what I've shown in the box up above is a page from our recent application to the VA with ESPA in the middle. And ESPA is a little black box about half the size of an iPad that does everything that that cart does based on some cell phone technology and some other wonderful processing stuff that's available off the shelf now. Um, it can receive wireless signals from the brain. It can wirelessly send signals out to your iPad or your computer or your deck of arm or whatever it might be. Uh, that's a three-year project. So uh, hopefully on this round they will go uh, ahead and get some funding for that. So well, those things involve, there's a wireless, a uh, fully implantable wireless device, which is a little bit further out than Arthur's other project is to get rid of the pedestal and put all that uh, radio frequency uh, transmission stuff underneath the skin so that there's nothing through the, the head and all. So I guess uh, in, in the scheme of things, Patrick Kennedy is, is uh, interested in developing real knowledge of how the brain works, how it functions so that we can address these types of issues that have been unsolvable previously. And he refers to it as the waste inner space. You know, how do, how do we understand what the brain is and what it does? Um, he said that this is like a 10-year moonshot. And in fact, it's more like a 1,000 moonshots in order of complexity. Um, I, I think I agree with him in the details, but I think in the first couple of moonshots, maybe we'll go into the first one now. Uh, we can maybe get to a place where we can provide some promise of assistive technologies for people that uh, are really, really needed. will have uh, prosthetic arms that not only you can move, but you can, uh, in some sense, feel? Absolutely. So uh, there's a couple of reasons to do that, but the most obvious one being we think you'll have better control of it if you can tell yourself what it's doing. Proprioception back from your arm is a really, really rich signal, which if your arm's not moving and you're commanding it to move, uh, for example, moving a cursor, if I imagine your hand moving and your arm's not moving, your brain's probably not happy about that conflict. So if you can give some feedback, great. But there's a couple of ways to do that. One is just simply put a vibrotactile sensor on the skin. Um, uh, it's quite frequently the case that the brainstem damage and the, and the stroke can result in uh, the outgoing signals failing, but the sensory signals coming back just fine. So that's the easy way to do it. 
maybe the more interesting question is can you stimulate the brain directly? And there's a large uh, community of neuroscientists addressing just that fact. Um, it's certainly the case that we have the technology and that in animals it's been demonstrated that you can generate uh, pulses that affect behavior. But we're a ways out, I think, from having the sort of pattern of stimulus to give you what you would think of as true sensation. So there's two answers depending on how you record the information. If you look at the EEG cap, uh, and maybe this will be similar to what Margaret goes through, uh, the experience to date is that you can, there's different rhythms in the brain that you can learn to control. They don't necessarily have anything to do with movement. But for example, if I imagine doing math and I imagine flipping my fingers around, my brain looks different in its electrical activity. Um, and you could use that sort of signal to do X, Y movement of a cursor, for example. And I'm not sure exactly what you'll be doing in New York, but that's one approach that's been taken. That can take a long time, by which I mean 30 days, 45 days, to learn how to do that. Um, the other one with the ALS participant I showed you where he was moving the cursor around the grid, uh, that was literally the first time he'd ever controlled anything. We, before that happened, we, for about 10 minutes, we showed him a cursor moving on the screen and said, imagine doing this. And then we said, okay, really do it now. And it just, before Abe could even get the instructions out, he was over. <laughs> Which was pretty exciting. Just since you're integrating science and art, yeah. um, Clark Hadid Gaiman, as you mentioned, yeah. his brother's a, a pediatric hematologist, oncologist, who I know, but his father is the Batman illustrator, Bob King. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> and, and I worked with, the, with art, yeah. <laughs> and he had a colleague who was a total nerd, and when he found out that he was working with the son of Bob Kane, he was just nuts. That, that was so, it. <laughs> so, yeah. But this is obviously a bright family. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah so, so, you know, so Dean Kane has done the Segway and a wheelchair. Yeah, um, and a wheelchair. The wheelchair that uh, uh, walks up and down steps and is obviously doing his arm, and his brother, as I say, very accomplished hematologist and oncologist, but like I say, but their dad is that. Which is the important. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's another group they're doing a wonderful arm too with Johns Hopkins, and uh, the Defense Department started about 10 years ago funding these guys, and actually Dean and a and Johns Hopkins were sort of being run in parallel to see who'd get them first, you know. And uh, I have to say that there's another group now that is on the charts for doing this sort of work, and that's Andy Schwartz of Pittsburgh in combination with the the guys at Johns Hopkins. And I have to say, I just saw their results yesterday back in, uh, in New Orleans, and it's, it's tremendous. It's, it's uh, great, wonderful validation of all this stuff. So, Something from Kathy. It was wonderful, John. Thank you. Any, do you have a question? Yeah. Oh, Kathy has a question. All right. She's going to correct me if I got something wrong. seen and that was demonstrated over the weekend is everything we needed to be already. Um, 
there's the things that are left to do are things like Arto uses a frequency spectrum that they probably don't want to see in the ER room or in the hospital, so we got to change frequency bands. It's, it's that kind of level of thing. But the ability to get all that data off the head at high frequency that people have been trying for 20 years to do, uh, Arto did. So, uh, as you know, it's hard for me to, uh, inappropriate for me to speculate. You know that we deal with that. Good. The question of I imagine there are many people, many people who are having strokes in a situation like this. Who's eligible for this kind of? You have everybody can afford to try to. Right. So. Um, yeah. Who's eligible and the cost, the, you know, concerns, things like that. Um, given the large number of people with strokes that are in this sort of incident. So, um, there are criteria for entering the trial. Um, I can't adequately speak to the medical ones. Probably shouldn't because I'm not the medical PI, but uh, it's, it's things like uh, <coughs> able to communicate, able to adequately give consent, um, either individually or through a caregiver. Um, no other complicating uh, Problems that would suggest an implant you know, can't be can't immunocompromised. Those, those types of standard things. Uh, financially, um, I, I don't believe there's any financial uh, burden incurred by the participants. On the other hand, I have to be very clear that there's no benefit incurred by the participants. Uh, it's experimental science. Uh, they can use the system while we're with them. Uh, when we leave, we disconnect it, and they are not allowed to use it for safety reasons. So it's, uh, it's truly the people that are involved are truly interested in, in giving to the, to the scientific community and understand, deeply understand that they can't get something back out of it probably that it's going to happen. So in terms of actually having the general public, I don't mean, I mean, in other words, now it's all experimental and the experiments are ongoing. And even as you design something smaller and smaller, it's still experiment. Is there any speculation on general, like outside of experimental, when a person could have this to actually? I, I can't estimate a date. I'm, yeah. I just am not allowed to do that. But I can tell you what has to happen and how. I, what I think will happen is that more people will join the clinical trial. So, for example, it was just. Mass General for a while. And then it was Mass General and Stanford. I think I can say that now Case Western is a site. Um, so more and more regions will have access to within three hours of each of those locations. And I think people like Van Schwartz of Pittsburgh will start doing tests. So as they spread, I think it'll be more joining the academic um, research. Um, the rest of it is really up to the FDA. We're in a safety trial, safety trial. When they deem we have enough evidence that it's safe, um, and as soon as somebody decides that there's enough benefit to the risk ratio, um, and it's hard to know when that's going to happen. But I think there'll be growing opportunities for people to participate. I have, uh, could I ask a, a last question, John? Yes. Um, so we're going to finish, uh, usually the Brain Cafe, we have a sign off with a dance. And I was very interested, I've heard about mirror neurons, and I was interested when you said that by moving your hand, people start to move, that part of their brain is also moving. So does that mean this entire audience is going to dance with these dancers? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Unavoidably. Yeah. So, um, and we've been asking this question about emotions, and uh, we decided, you know, that with some of this work, you know, and people have gone through so much that we'd like to always end in an upbeat feeling. And uh, Gene Kelly is a favorite, uh, it affected my life a lot. We'd all dance when we left the theater, and I guess that's it. He had got us <laughs> all those parts of our that's brain right. going, and yep. we couldn't stop when we left the theater. And it was always a source of great happiness, and I guess the thoughts and the action of our brains uh, would make us very happy. So I hope you'll all Join us in your brains <laughs> as we do this little last dance for you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>